My name is Dan Cherry. Uh, there's my email address and my Twitter URL. Uh, questions come up, please feel free to email me. I'm more than happy to answer questions or email. Yeah, it's fun to talk to people. Uh, so a little bit about Gigolo Pass, uh, in case you didn't catch me this morning. So I am an independent consultant um, based out of California, out in the U.S. I'm um, the author, co-author of this line is very out of date. It's the seven books now. I've got a second edition of Super and SQL Server being released in just a few weeks. Uh, I've done the dozens of magazine articles and website articles. I've uh, been usually an update on searchsqlserver.com or SQL Server magazine. Uh, and the Microsoft MVP for SQL Server products. I'm also Microsoft Certified Master for SQL Server 2008. And I'm a VMware VM expert. All of which means I'm the one guy that can say all three of those things in the same place. So that matters only a lot. And I got all these cool logos from the bottom of my slide. So we're going to cover basically four topics over the next hour or so. First, we're going to talk about how to diagnose performance problems in your virtual environments. We're going to talk about the balloon memory driver and some memory configuration settings that you can do within the SQL Server or with a virtual machine. We're going to look at memory duplication options and how those work within the, uh, the game environment, how those are going to work with SQL Server specifically. We're going to look at storage configuration options and how you can use those to maximize performance in SQL Server in virtual SQL Server environments. Sorry, it's a little bit more cost than the other building when you're working really fast for a 45 laptop. Uh, so, the first thing you should do whenever you look, when you start seeing performance problems in SQL, you know, do, do the normal thing. Look at the CPU on the virtual machine, make sure it's not doing anything that it isn't unexpected. But once you look at the virtual machine and you've figured out that nothing's really changed there and that the CPU is low and, and that everything is looking like you would expect it to, that's when you need to start looking at the host or the server that's running all the virtual machines itself to see if there's any sorts of performance problems that you may see at that level or maybe within another virtual machine that are going to be impacting the performance of your virtual machine. And the reason for this is because we're in this shared environment, we've got lots of different servers all doing different things, all trying to use the same physical resources within the environment. So if you've got 10 servers or 10 virtual machines all running on one physical piece of hardware, and one of those virtual machines starts using its CPU really heavily, running its CPU up 100%, when you go look at the other virtual machines, you're not going to see anything necessarily in their OS that says that there's a problem. All you're going to see is slow performance. And you're not going to have any explanation as to why. So when you go up to the host level, that's when you'll actually see some of these performance problems and you'll see that the CPUs are running really high and that you need to be able to address this other virtual machine because it's other problems on your, on your specific desk. So, and we'll talk about two specific hypervisors during the course of the session today. There are others out there, but these two are going to cover like 98% of the environments out there. And those two are both Hyper-V from Microsoft and VMware's uh, PC product. So when you're dealing with Hyper-V, it's fairly easy to find out if the host CPUs are kind of going nuts or if they're running too high. And that's because the Hyper-V host is going to support perf modules like any other Windows server work. So you can just fire a perf mod and connect to the actual host computer that's running your virtual machine and look at what its CPUs are doing. Because like I mentioned earlier, just because the guest CPUs are running normally, maybe running 10, 20, 30 percent, whatever they're supposed to be running, you may see that the host is actually running a lot higher than you would, than you would think it is. And that might be the problem, part of some of your problems. To resolve that, the easiest solution is simply move the virtual machine to another host. If you're running a large enterprise shop, you're going to have multiple hosts all configured in a single cluster. And so you can simply move a, move a guest from one host to another fairly easily. Um, if you're running a virtual machine manager installed, it's literally a matter of right clicking on the guest and telling you to want to move it to another host. There's going to be a slight hiccup of downtime as that's being done, but if the problems are bad enough, it might be worth the pain of doing that. Now, if you're running in a vSphere environment, however, you can't use the first one to get this information. So you've got two things you can look at running in a vSphere environment. You can bring up the vSphere management tool and connect to the vCenter server, and that will give you the performance metrics for the actual host servers themselves. And you'll be able to see in real time, and as well as historically, what sort of performance these, the physical CPUs on the physical machines have been doing. So you can see if this is a new problem or if it's an old problem, and which guest is causing that problem. It's 
the guest toggle the issue. Now, if you don't have a vSync server installed, you won't get that install that's trending. You can still get the real time if you're on a standalone box. Now, you can also connect up to, by using SSH, you can do SSH into the physical host. And you can fire up an application called ESX Top. Um, does anybody work with Linux or Unix before? Oh, okay, so you're familiar with Top, uh, the Top command in Unix. So this is basically the same thing as that. So what Top does is it kind of shows you what task manager would show you in Linux. It gives you a list of all the processes that are running, how much CPU load they're all using, how much memory they're all using. Um, and it gives you a few other basic statistics as well. So when you run ESX Top, uh, there's a number at the top that says percent used. It's kind of like up the right hand corner of the screen. If that number is over about 75%, that means you've got contention on the host and you need to look at either removing virtual machines off of that host, or if all your virtual servers or all your host servers are all maxed out, you're going to need to look at adding more servers or adding more CPUs or faster CPUs. Probably adding more hosts is going to be your best option to, just to expand the format. <coughs> Uh, so you know, I mentioned you can use uh, vCenter for historical trending in v, uh, VMware as a vCenter product. So if you want to do the same sort of historical trending in uh, Microsoft's product, you're not going to be able to use that, do that right out of the box. Um, you have to use a product called, F, it's called SCOM, a C-O-M, System Center Operations Manager. Um, so if you've already got SCOM in your shop, which if you're in a large enterprise, you probably do somewhere, but you may not even realize it. Uh, Scrum will do all the historical trending for you, so you can then use that to look at all the historical trends over time and see what's going on. Um, as with anything else when doing performance benchmarking, setting a good baseline is very important because you need to know what the, the things look like when they're normal, so that when there is a problem, you know what that problem is looking like. Um, obviously, if you've seen slow I.O., uh, on your server, you'll see that in the SQL Server error log, just like you normally would. That doesn't so necessarily, necessarily tell you where the problem is, but it'll tell you that there is a problem. And if, error, if slow uh, I/O error messages are slow in the error log, then you've definitely got the slow slow I/O that needs to resolve somewhere. And again, using the using the VMware tool, uh, vCenter client for the uh, SOM uh, monitoring server, will be able to tell you where or uh, first of all, in real time. Uh, performance monitor to be able to tell you which disk is having a slow problem and maybe be able to do a good indication of which VM is causing that slowdown. Because just like the CPU and the, with another virtual machine potentially giving you performance problems, you could have the same thing with your storage. You could have another virtual machine using the same physical storage as your SQL Server VM and cause all the performance problems that were on the other host. <coughs> Uh, so VMware and Hyper-V both have something called the balloon memory driver. Really high up there. Um, so what the balloon memory driver does is it's an application that runs on the guest and will, when necessary, take memory away from the guest operating system. Now, the reason it's going to do this is because there's something going on on the host operating system that needs memory back. Now, at first glance, this sounds like it's bad, probably really bad. In reality, this actually isn't, but it might not be. So the reason that the host is going to need memory back could be one of, one of several things. It's got some operation it needs to do. Uh, you know, maybe it's taking a backup and the backup software needs more memory, so it's going to go reclaim a few megs or a few gigs of memory from somewhere. This is all normal, this is all fine. It might also be an indication of something else very, very bad is happening. Something along the lines of one of the servers has failed. And we now need to restart a lot of VMs on servers that they're not normally running on. So if this were to happen, the Google memory driver is going to come and start taking memory away. So when the host is, is decided that it needs to start taking memory back from VMs, the first VMs it's going to start with are the VMs that have the most memory. Well, which SQL server servers are those going to be? The ones with SQL server on, because we're going to have the most memory, because we got the biggest boxes. So it's going to tell the servers, hey, I need you to take memory back. The balloon memory driver is going to come in and go, all right, I need to take memory back. Now, it doesn't do anything special. All it does is start allocating memory internally within the guest operating system. 
As it does this, you'll actually see in perf mode, you'll see some process sitting there running, uh, let's say the VM balloon or something along those lines. And you'll start seeing it eating up more and more memory, just expanding its memory footprint. What it's doing is it's simply telling Windows, hey, I need to allocate more memory, just like any normal Windows application would. That Windows application tells the OS, hey, I need more memory. The OS goes, okay, I'll go get you more memory. I'm out of memory, I'll go allocate it from somewhere else. So the Windows OS is going to look at all the processes running on the box and find the one that's got the most memory. Well, that's going to be the SQL Server, because it's got a big buffer full, it's got a memory allocated to it. So the SQL Server is going to be told, hey, go release some memory. If SQL Server is not able to release that memory, we're going to end up with even worse problems than we get to in a second. So what SQL Server is going to do, you know, hopefully by default, is it's going to simply release memory back to the OS. It's going to shrink the buffer pull down. It's going to shrink, shrink the plan cache down a little bit. Release that memory back to the, to the guest OS. That guest OS will release the VMware or the Bloom driver. The Bloom driver will contact the host server and say, hey, I've got memory that I can release back. Here, or it's going to release back to me here. You can go use it. So all this is perfectly normal and perfectly acceptable to have happen. Where we can run into problems is where we start overriding these. And uh, so when, when we can override these settings by simply turning off the balloon driver, which will tell the guest OS not to listen to these requests from the host platform anymore. So this is obviously not something we want to do under most situations because we want to clean nice in the environment and we want to release memory back. Another way we can prevent the uh, guest from releasing memory back is by turning on lock changes in the network. So again, something else I would not recommend doing unless you absolutely have to. Because we, again, you don't want to be keeping that memory unless there's, you know, unless there's a very, very good reason for it. So I personally, one of the MVPs who likes to state lock pages in memory should be off in most situations. There are a few edge cases where it should be on, but most of the time it should actually be turned off. And this is especially true in the virtual machine. And the reason again is we don't want to be holding on to that memory for no reason. And if there's a good reason that it's being requested back, we need to release it back. So I mentioned that there could be major problems if we don't release memory back because we've got the blue driver easily disabled and the block pages and memory enabled. And that thing that could happen that could really be hurting us at that point is that host operating system, if it needs memory bad enough, it's going to pick a virtual machine and it's going to start paging that virtual machine's memory to disk. Now, what we're going to see in SQL Server is nothing. All we're going to see, we're not going to get any indication that this is happening in the guest OS. All we're going to see in SQL Server is random performance problems that we can't diagnose. Because SQL Server is going to access its buffer pool and look for data. It thinks that buffer pool is in memory, when in reality, the host operating system has moved that data down to the disk. And so we now think we're getting some millisecond response times from RAM. And we're actually getting 10 or 20 millisecond response times from hardware. So we're going to see the random wait requests to try to access memory, and we're going to have no idea why. So, because of that, we need to play nice with the rest of the environment. Because if we don't, the environment is going to bite us back. And it's going to reinforce its will upon the guest operating system in one way or another. So, to try and combat this problem, we have this thing called memory reservations. This works in both VMware and in, in Hyper-V. So what I recommend doing is setting a, a memory reservation. So this is another memory setting that can be configured at the guest operating system level at the host, of the, on the host. So by default, when you spin up a new virtual machine, you tell it, I want X amount of memory. We're going to use 64 gigs as an example. So I build a new VM with 64 gigs of memory. By default, the memory reservation is going to be zero. We're not going to reserve memory for it. We're going to give it whatever memory it needs as we can. When we set a memory reservation, what that basically does is it tells the balloon driver you cannot take more than this amount of memory. You have to leave X amount for us. So, say I've got a, machine, a, a virtual machine set up on a SQL server, 64 gigs of memory in the box. I tell, see, or I tell SQL Server, you're allowed to use 58 gigs of memory, so I need 4 gigs for my operating system. Fairly standard configuration. Now, I know that my application will run acceptably with 32 gigs of buffer. Not well, 
but accept, it'll run at an acceptable rate. So what I'll do is I'll set a memory reservation on that server, on that virtual machine, for 36 gigs of memory. 32 for SQL Server, and I add four for Windows. Make sure there's enough, enough memory left for Windows. And then set my maximum for memory again to my normal 58 gig, and I leave my min server memory at zero. So now, in, during normal operations, everything works just like we normally would expect it to. But in the event that there's been some problem that's happened, I'm not going to get random paging because my balloon driver is turned on and my lock pages and memory is turned off. <coughs> so if the host needs to request memory, it can. It can take all the memory it needs down to 36 gigs. So I can play nice and give memory back when I need to, but at some point I'm going to say enough is enough. I'm keeping the rest of this memory for myself because I need it to actually continue to operate. So we can still keep the app running. It'll run slow. And we're going to put more load on the disk because we can't catch as much data. But we will at least keep the app running while we're getting through whatever problem it is we're trying to get through. So in both Hyper-V and VMware, um, we have the memory digitization feature. So this is actually new in Hyper-V. It was introduced in Windows Server 2008 R2 SP1. And we've seen it by SP1 to the actual host So what the memory, what this memory digitization option does is it basically allows us to overcommit the amount of memory in the server in, in, at the host operating system. So one of the neat things about VMware or virtualization in general is we've got all these operating systems. And they batch us from there. And there? No, you batch us from the there. The battery. Batch us from there. Batch us from there. I'll just call. Yeah. 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 I'll get you a new one. Yeah. So what, you know, when we've got all these virtual machines running on the server, you know, they've all got the same operating system. They're all probably Windows 2008 or Windows 2008 or 2. So we've got lots of copies of the same stuff in memory. So it's actually kind of cool that we can do this. When we've got all these VMs running, we simply, all the host is doing is it's looking at all this data that we've got in memory, and it's looking at all these data pages, and it's looking for duplicate pages. So we look for a bunch of things called, like, say, NT kernel DLF. That's going to be the same file with all these virtual machines. So it's going to find all these duplicate pages in memory, and it's going to simply throw away all this all the basically all the data. Because this is all going to be reloaded anyway, so this is no big deal. So it's going to simply put pointers in where all these other virtual machines were pointing to these pages and pointing to this one copy that we've got left of the NT. So we've now got, instead of 40 copies of NT kernel.dll sitting in memory, we only actually have one sitting in physical memory. Each VM still thinks it's got its own copy, but it really doesn't. And as long as nobody's trying to write to that big page in memory, we don't have any problems. And if it does, that's all the host operating system is going to do. It's going to simply take that one page, it's going to duplicate it, and let that one VM modify that page very easily. So this works really well for the operating systems. Because again, we, all the operating systems are running two copies of that thing. So this is no big deal. Now, unfortunately, for the most part, this is going to be very useful for SQL Server. The SQL Server buffer pool is not going to be the same across all the virtual machines. If it is, you've got something else going on. But this can give you some really good overcommitting of memory, allowing you to run extra virtual machines, maybe removing the need to balloon out or to take memory back from your guest OSs as, as your operations go, and you can duplicate that memory instead. So this is another set that you can disable or enable at the, at the virtual machine level. There you go. <laughs> so, oh yeah, it's a lot of um, So you can turn this setting on or off at the guest OS level. This is another setting that I would recommend leaving on for almost all your virtual machines. Even though it's not going to be helping much for the actual buffer pool for procedure cache, but you can at least get all the, the operating system uh, memory pages. Yeah. Does this work for database snapshots? Uh, so the question is, will this work for database snapshots? Uh, so this is the actual physical memory. Um, so it, if, if, 
Okay. So if you, you only have one copy of a patient in the database, it's not true. Yes. You have it in, a, in a snapshot, but you have it in the main database. Yeah, so it's the same page, but and when that thing is loaded into memory, the page headers should all be the same. This works on a always page level, as in 4K units? It's memory, memory pages. Memory so pages, that would be 4K, 4K units. Yeah. So, yeah, that should yeah, work, yeah, but this so is part of the protocol. Yeah, so if, if you're doing snapshots, yeah, good point. <laughs> So yeah, if you're doing snapshots, we're putting those snapshots and putting that in the bucket pool, it should be. But I think he has a point, because if the page is 8K, the data of the page contains the database can be yeah, the data past 4K. Yeah, first 4K might not be duplicated, but that last 4 should, as long as the page hasn't changed. Or if we still don't give you the phone. Uh, yeah, if you change any of the page and you've got foreign page detection turned on, it's already. So as long as, as long as you haven't modified the page, it should be good. At least half of it. No, but if you haven't modified the page, you're reading the page from the main database. Only once you modify the page, the page is copied through the snapshot. And then you have a separate page. Yeah, but if I if I query the page from the snapshot database. The database has this system before you. Yeah, it's going to twist it before it's going to change it before it doesn't matter. Half of the page can be. Yeah, so half of the, yeah, so half of the 8K SQL Server page should be able to count from the best as far as it That's a really, I've never been asked that before. So if you don't know, this is how we work. I would think that would work as you're outward thinking it will. Because, yeah, the database page is going to change as it reads the debugger rule. Because it has to be, so that it knows what page you're talking about. And then, yeah, so half of the half of the four k half of the eight k page should be able to be duplicated in memory. So, all right, so we'll work with buffer pool. Disregard what I said about not working with secret. I think it needs some experiment. Yeah, we should need help. We we yeah, need to do some serious experimentation to see just how well that works. Yeah, I don't have a solid answer. How it works, you want to find it on the way home. So then I have an hour flight home. <laughs> so I'll be able to wake up all of them, unfortunately. Um, I have no idea where I was going with that question. Right. <laughs> That's what happened to somebody else on a good question. All right, hopefully I'll come back to it. Um, so configuring storage. Uh, so storage is where we end up shooting ourselves in the foot the most when it comes to SQL Server and query performance. Because um, people think, well, it's a virtual machine now, so I can just virtualize the storage and it'll all be fine. Um, unfortunately, one of the bad things about storage is the performance doesn't get any better if you virtualize it. Um, we need the same amount of throughput when we're dealing with a physical machine or a virtual machine. <coughs> storage isn't any faster. In fact, it's probably a little bit slower when dealing with a virtual machine than dealing with a physical world. And there's, there's just no way around it, because there's an extra layer that we have to go through within the hypervisor to actually get from a physical storage up to the virtual machine. Um, so there are a few different ways you can attach storage to a virtual machine. Um, the first one is obviously the default, which would be to use a VM UK or a virtual base. Um, so by doing that, you simply, you know, it's, it's a physical file that just sits on the guest operating system hard drive. That's going to be the default way that most servers are going to be configured. And that's going to work well most of the time. When this isn't going to be working well is if you've got a lot of guest OSs that are all sharing the same physical hard drive. So if you've got a big RAID set created on the storage array, and you've got a whole bunch of, of VNDK and virtual disk files sitting on that on that uh, run, on that, that mount point, when you when all these virtual machines start using that, you know, all those symbols, or you know, they all start using their, what they think of their hard drives, that's actually putting stress on this the, the sand underneath. So you may end up with performance problems because you've got five or ten of these working machines all trying to get the same physical disk at the same time. So the easiest way to solve that is present a new one to the to the host and move the virtual machine's disks onto that new one. So the upside here is you can actually do this online without any impact on the performance if you're in a VMware environment. Currently, Hyper-V does not offer you a way to do that data. So if you do this in VMware, it's literally as easy as right-clicking on a virtual machine, clicking on Migrate, and selecting the option that says Change Storage Location. 
and then you can move all the move the virtual disk to the new one that you want to move it to. Click OK, and the, the virtual machine will then start copying the file to the new location. Hyper-V doesn't offer that yet. Hyper-V version three, that's going to be coming out with Windows Server 2012, will. So if you're getting a Hyper-V environment today, you definitely want to look at upgrading to Hyper-V version three when it becomes available. Probably, yeah, you can find it later this year, by August or September sometimes, but I'm guessing when it's going to actually show. So that will that'll give you some, some good ways to, to help migrate that very quickly and easily. Now, another option on how you present your storage is to actually use iSCSI to present the storage to the guest operating system. And the way I'm talking about doing this, and this does, of course, require that your storage rate supports iSCSI, is instead of connecting the storage to the host and then presenting it to the guest, actually configure the iSCSI initiator within the guest operating system, within the SQL Server guest OS. You simply configure that, tell it to go point to the storage array, Rescan the SCSI or present storage on the storage array to the, the new the new iSCSI server, and then rescan and you get a new hard drive in your guest operating system, which is given format. And at that point, the guest operating system, the guest, the guest server, is now simply another machine that's connected to the storage array. So the, the storage array can simply present all the storage it wants to it in whatever configuration you need to. Now effectively treating it as a physical computer, just like you would have form a virtual machine. So you can still get a lot of the benefits of being a virtual machine without the pain points of, of your storage trying to go through the virtualization layer. Now the downside of this is you are going to be generating a lot of network traffic, especially on a high load SQL server. So you're going to want to work with your storage team and your networking team to make sure that your network is up to spec enough that it can handle this additional workload that you need put a lot is you will probably improve a decent amount of load on the network. You'll also need to make sure that the jumbo frames are enabled at the guest OS, the host OS, the net physical network switches, and the storage array. Because you want to make sure that that's going to be enabled so you get the best possible throughput between the guest OS all the way to the storage. Um, so if you do you know what jumbo frames is? Oh, you do it? Okay. So what jumbo frames is for those for the rest of you that don't. Um, it's a network configuration that basically tells the TCP IP packet, the TCP packet, to get bigger. So by default, TCP uses a 1500 byte packet. A large portion of that packet is header information, so it's basically worthless as far as we're concerned. So that only gets you about 1200 bytes per actual TCP packet that will be transmitted over the network. When we turn the jumbo frames on, we tell the network packets that we're going to grow to nine, about 9,000 bytes. So that is a significant amount of information we're going to cram into that TCP packet and we're greatly reducing the percentage of header information that we're transmitting on the network. And considering that every single packet has to have that header information, that's a lot of wasted in space on the bandwidth or information on the, on, the, on the cable that's built. So if we can reduce the percentage of header information, we can get a better throughput on the network without doing any sort of major upgrades for our environment. So the third option that's available when presenting storage to a virtual machine is to use what's called a raw device mapping, an RVM. If, if you're in a VMware, if you're in a Hyper-V environment, it's called a pass radius. So what we're doing here is we're presenting the storage, or a new one, to the host operating systems, just like we would if you're presenting, you're presenting managed storage to the host. But instead of letting the host actually manage that, that storage, we then edit the uh, device properties of the virtual machine and give it that actual one directory. So instead of the guest OS, the host OS formatting the one and presenting a virtual disk to the to the uh, guest, the guest OS is what actually formats that one. So it is simply a native Windows Server one, even in a VMware environment which is Linux based. We simply just get an NTFS file system laid directly on the one. So we're basically now giving our guest operating system direct access to our private channel storage array without having to have any sort of funky network masking or, or virtual HVAs or anything in place. This can be a similar good configuration options as far as presenting storage because we can now harbor our storage and present it, you know, kind of like we were doing with the iSCSI, directly as if the guest computer was its own physical machine within the environment that we needed to work with. So, of those bottom two, of the second two, either iSCSI or 
rock by snap. It's going to depend on your storage team and how they want to configure things, which one is probably what you're not being able to do. Because you, you've got to get with them to, to make sure you can configure everything that way. Uh, some VMware admins prefer to use the iSCSI approach, some prefer the raw device map because they don't really know how the, how the raw device map would work, so you know, some of them don't like setting things up that way. Um, personally, I prefer setting up raw device mappings because uh, I'm not a big fan of iSCSI, but it'll work for you either way. Um, now, if you're dealing with this cluster, just because you're clustering your desktop operating systems, so one thing I do want to point out is if you're in a Hyper-V environment, you have to use iSCSI. Um, you cannot use pass through disks with a guest with a guest OS Windows cluster because that is not a supported configuration. Um, but you can use the <coughs> device mappings in the VMware side of the Windows cluster. Uh, so another option that's available to you, there will be if you're on one of the newer uh, kind of storage arrays, is auto tier. So within the storage arrays, they've presented a new configuration option where you can present a little bit of flash, a little bit of fiber channel, and a lot of SATA drives. And instead of carving out individual ones, you know, one one on flash, one on fiber channel, and one on SATA, you create, put all these in a pool, and you create the one within that pool. And this, what the storage array will do is, as the data is used more often, it'll actually move it up to the flash. And then as the data is no longer getting used, it'll move it from the flash to the fiber channel down to the SATA. So basically what it does is all the data that's being accessed the most, it puts it on the fastest storage possible. So this is really good in a virtual, when combined with virtualization, because we can simply move our lungs from more traditional, you know, rate fiber, rate 10 rate sets into this auto tiered environment. So that we can move the data around automatically as it's getting, as it's getting access more and more. Uh, so if you're in an EMC shop, this will be available to you if you're using the newer versions of the Flare operating system for your Flare on, or the new, newer versions of the Symmetric operating system for the, the Symmetric arrays. Uh, Repar offers this as a solution. Uh, and then there's several smaller sand vendors that are also there as well. And Del Compellent offers it. Del Compellent offers it. Most store manufacturers at this point are either have or are working on some flavor of this feature to, to make things work for it. Uh, a lot of uh, VMware or Hyper-V admins, like the same since you're in a virtual environment, let's just put all your data files and transaction logs and intend to be on a single disk. Because at the server level, it's all going to be on the one run anyway. So why not why not leave it to be on a single disk and just be done with it? And while yeah, you can do that, I still don't recommend doing that in a virtual machine. I still recommend having separate ones or separate virtual disks for each. One for data, one for logs, one for the OS, and one for the FDB. Uh, the reason I say I still like to have to do that is for a couple of different reasons. The first being, if we do end up with performance problems and we do need to split those things out later, it's a lot easier to do if they're already done. All we need to do is simply move a VMDK from one one to another, and you know, our problems are all solved. That's a lot harder to do if I could present a new VMDK and then move my transaction list, because that requires an outage. Whereas I can just move, you know, I can just do a sort of VMOTION, a sort of migration, and migrate my, my transaction log virtual disk to another one wide with no impact to production, no impact to the move. The other reason I like to do it is for the internal disk queuing within Windows. So when you create, when you've got disks in Windows, every disk has a queue. That queue is kind of backed up with operations. SQL Server loves putting, loves putting lots of pressure on the disk and trying to build those disk queues up. So while it's doing this, which is you know, perfectly normal, we expect this to happen, if you've only got one queue, no matter what, you're going to hit that queue. So if I've just got my, my, my data and my log file and I tend to be all on one virtual disk, and that virtual, and I'm, my, you know, my transaction logs are writing data down to the disk as I'm, as I'm writing the records, and I start seeing a slowdown on the physical disks, that queue's going to start backing up. Well, if I start read, trying to read data off that same disk now, those reads have to go into the queue, because it's just one disk. Windows doesn't know these are multiple, you know, there's multiple streams underneath, because this, this is all been abstract. So if I've got multiple physical files, I've got a, a one for my MDF, one for my LDF, one for my LDB, we put the exact same situation in the play, my transaction logs are writing down to the LDF, 
and that's all getting the whole other wing condensed, and suddenly there's a slowdown on that file for some reason at the host level. When I go to run a query, well, that query is now going to a different VMK. Maybe whatever spindle I'm trying to hit on that, you know, on that side is working fine, whereas the spindle that I'm trying to write the log to is still slow. So I can still read the data that I'm trying to read because it's on a separate, it's on a separate queue. And I don't have to wait for that queue to get processed to actually get that data back. So it's just another reason why I'm not having it just split up like that. <coughs> so another option you can see at the storage level is deduplication. How long do that is compression? So uh, this is a new feature that's starting to be implemented in more and more storage rates. Where it's, we're actually deduplicating and compressing at the storage rate level. So this isn't going to put any pressure on our guest operating systems, not to put any pressure on our host operating system. The CPUs that are going to be doing this actual work are the actual storage rate itself. So, <coughs> what it's so what it's doing is, as the new data is being written down, it's going to be looking at all the pages that are coming down. All the, the 64K writes that come down, and it's going to look for duplicate data within those pages. Some storage rates use a fixed width size. Some are going to use variable sizes to see how much, to see what sort of data it can, it can be duplicated. Excuse me. Obviously, if it's using variable width size, it's going to do a better job deduplicating, but it's going to take more CPU, CPU power to do that on the storage rate. Now, you wouldn't think that you'd get very good deduplication, deduplication of data from dealing with SQL Server database. And I can happily tell you that you actually can. Um, one of my clients, I was testing a storage array for them, and we moved, I, I can show you why, the Wi Fi out here. Um, we moved their, their encrypted medical data databases onto the storage array that had this duplication option, and we were still able to get a 30% data space reduction. And that's it was using the worst case scenario data. So by deduplicating the data, this gives us a few things. The first thing it does is it makes our storage actually faster. The reason it makes it faster is because we need to load less data off the disk as we're going through the data reading and writing. It also makes it faster because we're taking up less space in the storage arrays cache. So storage arrays are built surprisingly kind of like SQL Server. They've got a huge amount of data sitting on drive, and they've got this big tool of cache that they use to, to read and write cache, just like we do in SQL Server. And just like SQL Server, they're constantly moving data in and out of that cache. Well, if we're compressing all the data on the disk, when we're going to read that data off the disk and put it into the cache, we're taking up less space in the cache, so we can get more data into the cache. Now, unfortunately, OLTP databases don't use read cache on storage rates very well. But what does use really good use of read cache on storage rates is Windows. Because again, Windows is the same on all your virtual machines. All but about maybe a gig of Windows is going to be exactly the same across all your VMs. So as you've got these VMs running, the only thing that's going to be different between them is basically the page file. All the, the rest of the OS is all going to be the same. So as all your, your guest OS is all reading data off of the storage array, because you've got to remember, when you're dealing with virtual machines, the entire operating system is removed from a physical server to being stored on the storage array now. So as your operating systems are all sitting there running, reading up all, all the normal data that they read off of their hard drives, all that data is now going to come off the storage array. But if we're deduplicating that data, when the first OS reads those pages off the disk, it reads those blocks off the disk to, and accesses them, the data is going to get put into the storage array's cache. Well, now that all the other servers, as they go to read those exact same blocks, are just reading the same blocks that are already in cache. They don't need to go down to the disk. So we now get much better performance out of the storage array because we're not hammering it anywhere near as hard. And because even our database files are being are able to be compressed and deduplicated, we're able to get a lot of that information the same way. We simply store it in the storage race cache and when we do the request, it's already there. We're already recently getting all the information out of the cache. And like I said, I was shocked when I saw how much duplication we could do with SQL Server data. Um, when I put non-encrypted data onto that storage array, I got almost 50% duplication out of my database files. 
It was just out of relational databases that were, that were already mobilized. That was still able to get an absolutely massive amount of duplication out of these things. I was quite impressed. So the last thing I want to talk about, which isn't in the uh, abstract, is monitoring. Um, so monitoring of virtual machines and storage rates is incredibly important. Because if you're not monitoring enough different layers, you're not going to be able to find the right performance problem. Um, so you need to monitor not only within SQL Server, which hopefully you already do. There's a lovely company up in the lunchroom. No, I'd be more than happy to tell you a monitoring tool for your database. Help us. Generate one. You also need to monitor the guest operating system on top of that. You need to monitor your hypervisor and the physical host underneath it and your storage. Because you, and you need to not only be looking at all five of these things separately, but you need to be compiling these numbers together and make sure that all these numbers are lining up correctly. That when you're seeing the guest operating system say that it's in 40% of the CPU, that the host agrees that it's able to get it. 40% of the CPU. And then it's not going, well, yeah, you say you think you're getting 40% of your CPU, but you're actually not. Because this other machine is doing it, you know, it's maxing it out. And if this other machine was maxing out, we could actually run your CPU higher. So you need to be looking at all these things on a fairly regular basis to make sure that all pieces are doing exactly what they think they're doing and getting the resources that they think they're getting. Um, if, you're, you know, if you're not monitoring these things correctly and you're, you know, you're not laying things out as you think they are, and, you, and again, you do all the effects and you can baseline everything and make sure that, you, that what you're seeing as problem numbers are actually problem numbers and that they're not just your normal, your normal set of operations. Um, so some of these tools to do this monitoring are going to cost extra, um, specifically at the storage area level. I know BMC charges an arm and leg for their, their uh, monitoring tool, but these monitoring tools are worth it. Because if you can't really, if you can't see the performance problems, you can't resolve the performance problems. Um, that's one of the biggest reasons I always tell my clients they always need to pay extra for monitoring tools. Um, they are worth every penny of it. The first time you solve the performance problem with them, suddenly the fact that you have to pay a huge amount of money for something just goes away. Um, so I would, I would always recommend that you, that you pick up any monitoring tool that's available. So that's all the slides I have. There's usually some questions I know. There's the one really kick-ass question. <laughs> so any other questions? Yes, Neil? Do you sort of resource governor in size of VMs? How well does that kind of work against a, a sort of a, a physical implementation of resource governor? Uh, so the question was, how well would Resource Governor work in a VM compared to in a, in a physical server? And Resource Governor works very well inside a VM. Because um, the beauty of Resource Governor is, it doesn't know it's inside a virtual machine, so it's going to manage everything at that level. Um, so if, has anybody here used Resource Governor before? Besides Chris? <laughs> no? Just the two of you? Okay, so... So does anybody know what Resource Governor is? Okay, good. Lots of hand. That wasn't in his session earlier today. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Resource Governor basically throttles CPU and memory within SQL Server for processes to make sure that individual processes can't take over the entire server. Um, so, this, will be, this is going to work within your VM fairly well because it's going to look at how much CPU is available <coughs> within the VM and keep any single process from taking over the entire the entire guest. Um, so this can be very handy for problem applications. Um, I had a shop once that I worked at uh, where we had uh, a business unit that really liked building custom applications and running them against our production database. Unfortunately, we couldn't block them out because our application was designed to use Windows authentication, and this guy had a valid business reason to have an account to use the normal database application. So he could write his own apps to query the, to query the database as often as he liked, and would do so regularly. He did not like me very much when the resource governor came out, because suddenly his query performance went through the floor. All his queries stopped running very fast, because I decided that he did not need to be maxing out the CPUs and the memory on the server, and instead he was only going to get like 5% of the resources on the box. So he was not a very but yeah, it does work. That's a long-winded long way of saying it, so it works just fine uh, in a virtual machine and highly recommend using it. Thanks, Billy. 
Uh, you talk about the duplication. Uh, what vendor was uh, there with uh, this uh, work which you duplicate this database? Because different vendors say different things and uh, they say that's the, du the duplication. So the implementations of the duplications are different. Yeah, so uh, the question was what vendor, and then what one are you asking? Mm -hmm. um, so the question was what vendor was I using when I was doing that test? Uh, so that was a fourth vendor called Pure Storage. Um, they literally just released their array to sales like the last week. Um, it's a brand new unit. I had a, I had a beta unit. Um, so I think they're on revision 14 of the, of the operating system. I had revision so they've made improvements since the testing that I did. Um, that was one of the reasons I was doing the test before that was so I didn't have to use the way to it. Um, so yeah, the company's called Pure Storage, it's PureStorage.com. Um, it's an all flash array, so it's incredibly fast to begin with. And then they put the duplication on top of it. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I'm doing in that particular example. Um, but yeah, every, every vendor is going to have a different implementation of the duplication compression. Um, it's all a matter of how they implement it as to how well it's going to work for you. Um, so it's not much of one of those things you can't really tune too much, just to check checkbox, turn it on, turn it off. Um, but when it's on and it's working well, it, it is a very, very noticeable. Um, I actually, so part of what they hired me to do was to try and max out the performance on their box and see what it could take, and I couldn't do it. Um, the infrastructure that I had the box connected to couldn't push enough data to max out their storage. Um, so I actually don't know the upper end capabilities of that box. It's kind of scary. And, uh, can I take some more yeah. questions? And when you, when you test the array, did you test something like uh, uh, primary disk and differential and the duplication of uh, only in a normal system? Like you got one uh, parent disk and some default differential disk for your Windows and uh, only uh, disk, uh, virtual disk for your Windows. Which we found better. Did you test that? Um, I did not test that. I went worst case scenario and I just deployed 50 VMs to one one. But it was 50 VMs on uh, every VM, VM on uh, dedicated disk, not differential. Correct, no, no differential disk. Mm -hmm. So every, every VM was taking, as far as VMware was concerned, every VM was taking up 11 gigs of space. Mm -hmm. um, I had 50 some odd VMs. Totaling about 845 gigs of space, according to VMware. If you look at the storage rate, I was using I think, 23 gigs of space. So that was an absolutely massive amount of data. So for the OSs, it was absolutely fantastic. Yep. Uh, have you seen virtualization used to reduce the startup time to help improve SLAs much? Um, first of all, have I seen? Virtual machines used to reduce the SLAs by reducing startup time right. to better better hit SLAs. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah, I, I haven't seen that as a primary reason to virtualize. I've seen that as a happy side effect. Um, so if you've ever booted up a physical server or watched a physical server boot, they take forever. Um, the thing that takes forever is that physical memory test that physical servers do every time they restart. Um, virtual machines don't bother doing that because they already know that that's happened at the same layer. Um, so you can typically restart a virtual machine much, much faster, which gives you this happy side effect of um, being able to e more easily maintain your SLA because the reboots take so much less time, um, especially if then you throw some faster storage on top of that, or it's easy to get storage, but the, the OS is already taking the cache, and things just get even faster. Um, I can typically, a typical VM be in a, in a, a normal environment, we usually reboot in 30 to 60 seconds. Um, and then and that's even with you know, 16 or 32 gigs of X, um, where a physical box with that much memory could take five or 10 minutes to reboot. So I have some that happens out of there. Yeah, so you might have five, two or three times more than it's possible in your SLA window for a month or a year. You know, so it gives you that, those maintenance windows and possibly to. At a time, you've got more time to play with. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, going with it, I should actually have a slide on this about this to update this deck to Super Server 2012 is uh, Windows Server Core Mode. Uh, I mentioned this during the keynote this morning. We installed it on Windows Server Core, 
you know, you're, you're not, you don't have, you know, the whole Windows UI that you need to worry about, which is 70 some odd percent of our patches that we install on a regular basis. And so if you're not installing those patches, those patches are all obviously requiring reboots, that reduces the number of reboots we need to, again, you know, help help us get our SLAs because we're, we're not using reboots and making them out of the form of the will reboot even faster because they're so much smaller. Um, when, I, when I did that test with the storage array, some of my OSs were actually core mode and some were not. And I was surprised at how much smaller the core mode machines were. Um, a regular window, full Windows 2008 R2 install was about 11 gigs before I installed CD server. Uh, the guest OSs that was core mode were only about 6.5 gigs. So 5 gigs of different data just because I installed the UI. Um, was the, the, the ridiculously large amount of data. But we got tons of dollars there to have four months of lessons. And then you saw some sort of install on top of that. It's a really nice, tight OS. I can run in a really small memory footprint. But to, to run in you know, the smaller the memory footprint for Windows, the more memory you need to do the CDC to put that for. So, um, one thing we worked on, I saw a slide, and you uh, suggested that you switch off um, uh, <coughs> the, um, block pages in memory because of the balloon drive. Yes, I I was under the impression that that just prevents the ticket sort of from being paged out in the page file. And it was still get back to the office. I know AWE didn't do that, but since we have 64 bit, that's a good. very good point. Very good point. I agree with you. I mean, even with locked pages, SQL Server will respond to that refresh. It will differently. Is how I, is how I understand it. And I need to do more testing on this. With the rules to see how it responds. Yeah, and the, the, I don't think it responds the same if you've got a turn on or not. Because it's going to change how it's how it is potentially going to function. Any additional things about those questions? Give us a contact info up there again. Um, if you have questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I think I'm having a lovely time in the country, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I will see you all. Either later today or tomorrow, as uh, we come back to tomorrow, I have one more session tomorrow, thankfully. So I will, I will see you all tomorrow. Thanks all for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.